This nugget on technology and process debt is the first of several focused on agile principles. Recognizing that Scrum is one of many agile development processes, in this nugget and in the next several, we're going to focus on purely generic agile principles. We've already discussed in this series very Scrum specific principles. We've talked about the Scrum rituals and the Scrum artifacts. As I said, we're going to focus more on just pure agile principles. And the key of those is a concept we've talked about a lot through the series already, which is technology and process debt. In this nugget, we're going to focus about technology debt, fixing the code. Through the process of developing our sprints, we may have introduced less than optimal code, or through the process of adding new functionality into the code, we may have made some shortcuts and implemented some code that works but is not as perfect as we want. So we have introduced technology debt into our code base. We'll focus in this nugget about what technology debt is and how to fix it. And we'll also discuss several other principles of agile development that people ask a lot of questions about when they're working in an agile iterative fashion. What about architecture? Do we need to do architecture? How does architecture happen? And in this nugget, we'll talk about the fact that yes, architecture happens in Scrum. It just happens in a late fashion. We'll introduce this concept of Sprint Zero. Getting ready. Preparing the environment, preparing the team to be ready to start on the first true sprint, which is going to be sprint number one. We will talk about database administration and very similar to architecture definition, there is DBA work in Scrum. We just do a little bit of DBA work on an as needed basis. And finally, we'll talk about a key agile principle, which is refactoring, which is again, improving our code base. But first, technology debt. And technology debt is inevitable. in Scrum projects. And why is it inevitable? Because we focus on just enough. So the first time we're touching a piece of code and we're implementing a story, we focus on doing just enough code for the story. And the first time through with just enough code for the story, we probably have written good code. But the next time we focus on just enough where we're going to augment the same code for the new story. And the story has three story points worth of effort. We're going to focus on doing just enough work to augment the story for the new, to augment the code rather for the new story and get the job done in three story points worth of effort. And we probably did okay. But after we do this three, four, five dot, dot, dot times, as we're opening up the same code base to do augmentation of just enough, and we're focused on completing the just enough within the allotted time, we will inevitably write some bad code or wish we could do it better. And every time we wish we could do it better, we are introducing technology debt. Technology debt is the biggest enemy of Scrum. It's inevitable in Scrum. Our focus of Scrum of doing just enough code for each story is going to eventually, as I said, introduce technology debt, bad code. As soon as we wish we could do it better, we have introduced technology debt and we need to make a commitment to fix it. And that's the key to technology debt. The key to technology debt is not that when we're working on that fifth story, that again, using the same scenario is only three story points in effort that we say, well, technology debt has gotten to the point, I need to add a plus three more story points of code improvements. 
when we recognize the time has come when we have technology debt, we need to make the commitment to fix it. We create, as I've said, the team story. We alert the product owner that says, the code that maintains our customer database has hit a technology debt problem. I request your permission to add a story. As a matter of fact, I would like the story added to the next sprint so we can eliminate the technology debt. We do that through the team story. We don't just automatically start doing it when we open the code. But it's important that we make the commitment to fix it because it is a killer of productivity and it kills the quality. Bad code. Why does bad code kill productivity? It takes longer to review and understand and it takes longer to implement change because we have to make each change that fifth time we've opened the story that next level of change is going to be harder to make simply because we have to be more careful we have to dot every i and cross every t three times because we're working in a complex code area so it kills productivity and absolutely kills quality because the more complex the more likely for errors so as I said technology debt is inevitable it's necessary the key is when we recognize technology debt we make the commitment to fix it and we introduce the team story and we push the product owner to implement the stories, the team stories, the technology debt removal stories in a future and hopefully very near future sprint. So recognizing that technology debt is inevitable is necessary, we need to be aware of what causes technology debt so that we can recognize it and again take actions to improve it. To me, the main reason we get technology debt is time. It's the minimal effort and we need to do it within the story point estimate. So we need to do the minimal work. We need to strive to get the story done within the story point estimate and as a result we may write less than optimal code. Fact. We will often get into technology debt as a result of lack of automated test or as a result of not producing enough. In the next nugget, we will be talking about various other agile principles and one of them will be an automated build and an automated test. If we don't have enough automated tests in place to support full regression testing we don't have the mechanisms in place to recognize to support to remove and to encourage the removal of technology debt so again if because of time pressures we have a lack of automated tests that again is a team story we need to write better we need to write more automated testing to support the agile principle of continuous builds and continuous integration. Sometimes we will get into technology debt because scrum time, like everything else, is just in time. So therefore when we did that module for customer maintenance and we did the first story, we did just enough scrum design to support story one. And then we picked it up the second time and we did just enough design to support story two, three, four, five, onward through the life of that particular piece of code. So again, our evolutionary just in time scrum design principles can introduce technology debt because we need to take the team story and redesign 
components of the module. And finally, technology debt can happen simply because of lack of documentation. The code isn't well documented. And I know an example from a, 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 a real live example, and this was not on a Scrum project, but it's, it's equally relevant to a Scrum project. This was way back when I was doing my undergraduate degree, and this is way back in, in the 70s. I was looking at a piece of code that was the Fortran plotting subroutine. Why I was looking at the Fortran plotting subroutines, don't ask, don't go there. But I was looking at this piece of code, and it was an assembly language, and it was complex. Now, mind you, I was just an undergrad student, so my coding abilities may, may have been somewhat limited, but I was able to read page after page after page of this Fortran. Um, I guess it wasn't in assembly language, it was in Fortran now that I think of it, but it was very complex code. Or very, I had read pages and pages and pages of the code, and I was understanding what was going on, and then all of a sudden I hit about a half a page of code, and it just wasn't sinking in. I just wasn't able to understand what it was. So being a student, I was trying to understand the code from reading the code. I didn't want to read the comments. I didn't want to look at the documentation because I wanted to prove myself as a student. But finally, the point that I just couldn't figure out what this complex code was doing, so I looked at the comments. And this particular coding principle was over on the right-hand side of the, the Fortran code. There was always a comment line, and the comment line was to describe what that line of code or what these combination of lines of code was all about. And then we went over and I looked at the comments for this particular line of code or, or half page of code. Boy, was I disappointed. When I looked at the documentation, the documentation said, if you're looking at this code and you don't understand what it's doing, Welcome to the boat. I was assigned the job of documenting Fred's code. Fred is no longer with us. He left before he documented this code. And for the life of me, I can't understand what this code is doing either. Hope you have better luck than I do. So it was lack of documentation. The code appeared to be documented, i.e. the peer review of code documentation probably wouldn't have caught the lack of documentation because the perception was the code was well documented because we had this lovely flowing text that went line to line to line that looked like true developer documentation, but it was useless. So again, because of lack of time, because of need to get the story done in, in the allotted time, not only may we write less than optimal code, we may write less than optimal documentation. And therefore, again, we may need to create a team story to take one to two story points of time to go back into the code and simply fix up the documentation. No matter the source of technology debt, we need to make the commitment to get it fixed. And in spite of saying that technology debt was inevitable, which it is, we can all take proactive measures to prevent debt. Preventing debt is a commitment from the team to do their best, to not cut corners, to ensure that the documentation follows standards, et cetera, et cetera. When we recognize we have technology debt, the key is the team has to commit to writing the stories to eliminate. So not only do we need to have the team's commitment to try to prevent technology debt, recognizing that it will still happen, we also need the team's commitment to write the team's stories when we recognize technology debt. It takes time to write a story. If you are, again, trying to get your own story done and you recognize technology debt and you don't have time today to write the new story, to eliminate the technology debt, it's sometimes easier to say, oh, well, somebody else will be looking at this, this particular piece of code in, in a day's time, in two weeks' time, in three weeks' time. I'll let them write the story to eliminate the technology debt because I'm sure they'll have more time. We need to get the team's commitment that they will write the stories to eliminate the debt as soon as they see them. As part of our commitment to ensure that we prevent technology debt, 
we need the team commitment to peer reviews and we need to do better jobs of peer reviews than that example I just showed you a few moments ago. A quick glance peer review said, oh, documentation is good. Look at that. Every line of code has beautiful little words over there. We need to ensure that all peer reviews do look at it. Doing a peer review is far much more than ensuring we put the pretty little tick boxes on the back of the story card. Doing a peer review is the commitment to take the time. And again, we're only asking for five to 10 minutes because we're only doing a peer review on a small piece of code, on a small test plan, on a whatever, but taking the time to do it right. Preventing debt is absolutely satisfied by adequate testing. And as I said, adequate automated testing So that as we take factors to eliminate debt, such as refactoring, which is code improvement, which we'll talk about in just a few moments in this nugget, when we're doing refactoring, code improvement, if we have appropriate automated tests in place, we can refactor with confidence because we know what test cases are going to be in place. And we know if we refactor, and the code still passes all of those test cases, then in fact our refactoring has been successful, we've eliminated the technology debt, and we've ensured that the functionality being delivered is still identical because again the tests have been passed. A big concern a lot of people have new to Scrum and Agile principles is the fact that there is no perception of architecture definition being done in place. In traditional development, we always have a very senior architect come in and do the overall architecture definition to ensure that we have sound forward facing strategies in place and that the code we're going to develop will be consistent with architectural strategies and will be positioned for future productivity and enhancements and so on and so on and so on. So all of those reasons that architects have given us over the years to and I say this with, with all the love in my voice to justify their position as technical architects, literally doesn't happen the same way in a Scrum project because we don't do this big upfront definition, the BUFD or some people B -U -B -F -U -D, um doesn't matter the way you define the acronym. The key is there is no big upfront definition. It is just in time architecture. And that scares a lot of people. A lot of people believe that we need the big upfront definition to ensure we're positioned for success. The Scrum approach is just enough architecture. And the reason Scrum believes just enough architecture to build it as you go is because often this big upfront definition, ensure position for success, has positioned technology, architecture, rules, process that's not needed. And that's the key impediment to the traditional upfront architecture definition is often we're providing architecture process, layers of middleware, whatever it is that just isn't going to be needed. When we embarked on this, we thought we should have three levels of servers, a, a GUI server, a database server, an application server, and we put all of the architecture in place to support those three levels of servers only to realize that the database component is insignificant or that the GUI component is not going to be served through a, a GUI server. It's going to be served through a web portal, et cetera, et cetera. And we have invested time in architecture that's just not needed. So again, the fact is we don't do no architecture in Scrum. We do just enough architecture. We build it as we go. And we have to have this principle of fearless forward progression. Don't worry about what's next. 
if today we have a single server in place and that single server satisfies today's stories perfect fearless forward progression don't worry that at some point in time we may need a database server and don't worry that at some point in time we may need an application server if what we have in place today satisfies the stories we're working on today that's what we do build for today if tomorrow next week next month we need a new server we need new architecture I think you're guessing where I'm going we write a team story or stories to develop the future architecture requirements and these future architecture requirements are absolutely 100% based on what we need for forward, forward progression and again I've repeated myself just enough architecture is the scrum way don't worry that you're going to have technology debt don't worry that you're going to have team stories to introduce new architecture that's the way we want it to be because we're not potentially building on necessary architecture we're building just the right amount of architecture and some people prefer to use this concept of sprint zero for just enough architecture or probably a better way to say it sprint zero is used for the initial and basically what we're saying is if we need to start working on stories in the very first sprint so sprint number one we have worked with the product owner and we've selected eight stories for a total of 24 story points worth of effort and we're going to complete that in our two-week sprint the question is what are you going to implement that on where is your build server where is your your database where is your environment so a lot of instances we will create a sprint zero as the first step in just enough architecture to roll out the initial architecture sprint zero is going to be focused on developing the project infrastructure do we need a build server do we need a test server do we need some initial architecture in place sprint zero is often focused on establishing the norms and procedures yes this is scrum and this is how we're going to do scrum often that project infrastructure may require a minimal database and we'll talk about databases in just a moment but maybe just maybe in that sprint zero we have to create the initial customer table and we have to populate it with a single record probably with a limited number of columns simply to get the project started a lot of people think that a very important aspect for sprint zero is to do that initial hello world module module one per se the first module that's going to be built into our build server the first module that's going to be in, in built into our automated test process is a very simple hello world a start uh, a display and a stop just to validate that all of the project infrastructure is in place and a lot of scrum projects will do the initial story time in what we call sprint zero so that when it's time to do our planning for sprint number one we already have a good backlog of stories on the product backlog sprint zero is not specific to scrum sprint zero is not required if you have a project in an established scrum organization that already has build servers and test servers and norms and procedures in place and everything in place maybe sprint zero is not going to be sprint zero maybe sprint zero is simply let's get together the day before our first sprint plan and do a story time 
So sprint zero does not need to be the same length as any other sprint. When we were talking about sprint length a few nuggets ago, we were adamant that the sprint length needs to be fixed. The only sprint length that doesn't need to be fixed is this ubiquitous, unique sprint zero. And in sprint zero, it's typically shorter. We want to get started in sprint one as quickly as possible, but depending on how much work we have to do with all of this in a brand new organization, maybe sprint zero is actually four weeks while we put together all of the infrastructure where our expectation is all sprints will be two. Brand new organizations, we may need an elaborate sprint zero. I would discourage elaborate sprint zeros because people want to get started. If we're taking four weeks establishing the environment for Sprint, to me that's not a very good public relations message into the organization that says Sprint is flexible, adaptable, and nimble. And here's Steve's team taking four weeks to even get ready to call themselves Scrum Ready. So try to avoid long Sprint Zeros. Try to avoid, where possible, Sprint Zeros altogether. And as I say, maybe you can get away with a, a, a half day to one day story time, but recognize that we may need something to do just to kickstart our project. And very similar to the discussions we've already had on technology architecture, sometimes there is some very specific database administration required to start Scrum and throughout Scrum. A lot of projects will have a DBA as a member of the Scrum team. And in a lot of instances, it's actually acceptable to have your DBA on a Scrum team as a Scrum team member, but an, as invited. So for three, four, five sprints, there may, be, there may be no database work needed, and therefore the DBA is not invited to any of the Scrum sprint activities. But after four or five or six sprints, we then need to do some database work. So we invite the DBA in and invite the DBA to join the team and participate in all of our Scrum rituals for one or two or three sprints while the database work is done, and then excuse them and we'll invite them back. So depending on how database intensive your project may or may not be. You may have some unique characteristics of how you deal with a specialized resource like a DBA. Be prepared as we discussed in Sprint Zero. You may have to have a minimal database in place to get started, but be prepared for change. Expect to bring the DBA in on a regular basis if the DBA isn't already a member of your team on an ongoing basis. And again, for lower level uh, database analysis work. Often the DBA is just another team member. And for several sprints is writing code to satisfy stories and then we'll take a role as a DBA as needed to do the tables, to do the joins, to do the schema definitions and then go back to writing code. So. Again, various aspects for dealing with the support required from a DBA. Find the method that's going to work for your project, but be prepared for change. Don't, don't, don't ever attempt to do 100% database definition up front. That is not Scrum. Be prepared for change. Watch for technology debt. Have we got suboptimal tables? Perhaps our tables have become non-normalized. Perhaps we need to add more indexes. Perhaps we need to partition our database. Perhaps we need to percept, we need to. So it's very, very easy to introduce technology debt is always is we're adding a column or two at a time to support specific stories that it's very easy to denormalize, to need more indexes, to de need more joins, to need more custom views and absolutely be prepared to refactor 
and we'll discuss what refactoring is in just a moment, but refactoring is improving, and absolutely don't forget your DBA. Whether your DBA is a full-time team member or your DBA is a called in on an as invited as needed basis, but be prepared to write, to support, to encourage good, effective, just-in-time database management within your Scrum project. And probably anticlimactic after all the buildup I've given to you on refactoring. What is refactoring? As I said, it's code improvement. It's the need to implement continuous design for every story. And as we're looking at our continuous design for every story, there is often a need for, I'm going to call it a timeout. We need to stop. We need to create that team story. We need to ask permission from the product owner to refactor. We have a module that's too complex. We have a module that's poorly documented. We have a module that is untested from an automated sense. Or we believe the test coverage is inadequate. We have a database that needs to have performance improvements done on it. We have identified through our continuous design any of a number of instances where we need to refactor the code. And as I say, that's stop, take a timeout, ask permission from the product owner to improve the code. And a key aspect of refactoring is restructuring the code. It's not just fixing it with a Band-Aid. Fixing it with Band-Aids is, is what got us to the point where we had to refactor. Refactoring is restructuring the code, making it better and ready for new stories. And it's critical that we take those timeouts periodically to restructure the code and make it better, make it ready to support the new stories. This nugget was focused on technology and process debt. Our main focus was on technology debt, finding issues, writing team stories, and committing to fixing them. Why did technology debt exist? It's because we're doing just enough time, just enough to satisfy the story, and we're doing just in time architecture and just in time database. So we spent some time talking about the myth that architecture doesn't exist in Scrum. Architecture does exist, but it's just in time architecture and we're doing enough architecture to satisfy our immediate requirements with the expectation that we will have a need to improve and refine the architecture as we go forward. We talked about this concept of a sprint zero where we're basically readying our environment. The environment. It may be some architecture stuff. It may be setting up our technology servers. It may be setting up our original database. It may be setting up our hello world to get us started and it may be setting up a minimal database. Whether we do a sprint zero or not is going to depend on our organization's maturity in Scrum and our need to ready the environment or whether we're ready to jump right into sprint one and start writing business stories. We discussed database administration where again, just like technology definition, it's just in time and we need to improve 
and refine. And we closed with this concept of refactoring, which is code improvement to eliminate the technology debt. And we do that through the team stories, and we do that through code restructuring. We stop doing Band-Aid solutions and we commit to, we get the product owner's commitment to restructure the code so that it's then ready for future enhancements through the next stories. This concludes our nugget on technology and process debt. I hope this module has been informative for you and thank you very much for viewing.